fellas, listen up. Here's the thing. Sometimes muscles are stubborn and you need to punish them in order for them to grow. I'm gonna follow up on the bro talk we just had the other day and tell you about the areas that I improved in most, which was chest, legs, and arms, which was purposeful. I was trying to bring up those areas. And then the exercises I used to get are done. They're all oonga boonga exercises that I didn't have to think about, oh, my form. I could trust that they laser targeted what I was trying to grow. And then I just focused on effort at that point. All right, bro, kicking it off with number one is an exercise in wisdom. If you have a strength, keep your strength to strength. So if you have overdeveloped pecs or back, or whatever the case may be, don't neglect that and let it deteriorate just to bring up your arms or your calves or whatever, because then it's like a, a hamster running an eternal race, bro. You're, you're hustling in reverse, okay? For example, bro, my pecs are a huge strong point, emphasis on huge, yet they still improved a lot despite me mostly focusing on improving my arms and legs, which did improve a lot more like percentage wise. I, I'm not great at math. I guess that's the right term to use, but everything improved on top of my strong points. So starting right off with it, bro, for pecs, there's four main exercises that I rotated, the first of which being the t-shirt touch Larson press. Now this is for fellas that do their due diligence with doing appropriate amount of chest pressing volume. They do enough to progress at that, but they notice that their shoulders grow more than their pecs. Well, this is the exercise for you, baby, because we're optimizing everything when it comes to pec development. So there's two technique fixes that come into play with this. It breaks down into the t-shirt touch pause, and then obviously you're, you're kicking your feet up in the air, removing leg drives, the Larson press part. So what you gotta understand about the bench press is the part of the movement that gives you the most pec growth is the bottom, like closest to your chest. That's where it stretched the most. A lot of times when people pause, or a lot of times they don't pause, they just bounce the bar off their chest. They're cheating themselves out of that portion of the movement, which gives you the most growth. It's like trying to collect rainwater and you got holes in the bag, bro. You're never gonna get any water that way. So what does the t-shirt touch do? You don't even have to pause when you do this, to be honest with you, bro, because if you just come down under control and lightly touch your chest without even pausing, that'll be a night and day difference to like the traditional type of pause where you're releasing tension from the bar at the bottom and cheating yourself out of those pec gains. But you just come down, touch the fabric of your t-shirt, and that's it, bro. You don't sink the bar, you touch it, you can pause if you want to, or you can come back up. Bro, that alone is gonna do so much for adding meat to your pecs. We kick it up a notch, we take it to the next level with the Larson press. Now, I'm always gonna advocate for Larson presses. I owe a lot of my pec development in general to this movement and variations of it. Similarly to the t-shirt touch pause, the Larson press removes your legs ability to assist with the upper body and that bottom most portion of the lift. So it becomes a pure upper body press. You can disagree with that if you want, but talk to any high level power lifter and that's exactly why they do the lift, okay? That's how I learned it from Freaky D years ago. So it stands to reason that if you're making the bottom most portion of the lift harder, you're making the lift more conducive for hypertrophy as well because that's where it grows most anyway. So a lot of times people think I'm removing my feet off the floor, I'm removing stability. Well, no, you're not. You create stability in your lower body on the Larson press with your glutes. It's like glute drive. Talk to Dennis about it. He'll tell you the same thing. It stops any left or right movement that you would get otherwise if you weren't doing it, right? All right, we talked a little technique. Your pecs are screaming in agony from the t-shirt touch Larson presses, yet I still have three movements for you. Now, the first of which is going to be, you already know, bro, if I'm gonna talk about Larson press, I'm gonna talk about ring work, specifically ring push-ups. I made a whole video talking about the host benefits and how to scale them, so I'm not going to do that here. Watch that video after you watch this one. But what they do is they target every function of the pecs hyper-optimally, bro. And I hate even using that word, but it really does give you that full stretch, full tension at the bottom, and full tension at the top, which you don't get on a bench press or really anything that doesn't allow you to basically hit a most muscular under load, bro. That's the biggest way that I can describe it. It just feels incredible. If you're someone that feels shoulders or triceps on bench press most of the time, you add this in to supplement that, bro, and you're gonna feel the most enormous, dangerous feeling chest pump that you've ever felt in your life, bro, I guarantee it. Here are the other two exercises. One is gonna be the fly press. It's more accessible to people in the gym that already have dumbbells. It feels very similar to the ring push-up, bro. Maybe a little less of that most muscular action at the top, but you do get that full stretch, full range of motion at the bottom. Really good as well. I really like subbing those in. I'm doing those for the hundreds for reps these days. Last but not least, now let me preface by saying that if this is good enough for Julius Maddox, who can bench 
100%, except Sam and probably Max, your deadlifts, bro, I'm not going to lie to you, bro. You got to do the movement because he really likes pec flies, okay? Josh Bryant programs pec flies for a lot of his guys. He is a world-renowned powerlifting coach. He coaches and builds some of the most enormous human beings that I have ever seen. If you've seen a man of that caliber in person, they just don't look real, all right? They look like literal monsters. If you're someone that has tried everything up until what we're talking about now, pec flies will literally isolate your pecs. It's no brainer. A lot of times we discredited pec flies and saying, oh, you get so much more tonnage and training effect from the bench press because you can move so much more weight. And then that's like a sub 315 bench presser telling you that isolations are freaking unnecessary, okay? I'm tired of the nonsense, I've had enough. Here's the thing, fellas. You're targeting and isolating your pecs. If it's a weak point, there's actually a case for you to put a higher priority on that. Not doing it before your bench press, but doing it after when you have more energy early in your workout as opposed to tacking it on at the end, which is how a lot of people traditionally use the movement. But you can make a case for either. So number five and number six is going to be strict easy bar curls and then some variation of incline curl, which deviates into two more. So I guess it's three exercises, but it's two categories of exercises, okay? All right, so arms, the arms, okay? I just added my little accent to it, bro. This is, I'm just talking to y'all, we're kicking it. But I have learned from the respective CEO of triceps, Mr. Jeffrey, and the CEO of biceps, uh, natural hypertrophy, my brothers, that training arms is cool. I can't imagine myself not training arms now, bro. I can't believe I went without it for years, to be honest with you. That's neither here nor there, okay? We understand that if you wanna get bigger arms, you have to train them. Now, I like doing things my own way. They inspired me and I kinda just took what I know about training in general and then selected exercises that targeted what I needed them to target and eliminated things that I needed them to take away. Which for me is my ability to use my overpowered chest, back, lower back, hips, to aid in isolation movement. Bro, imagine doing a bicep curl, all right? Like a standing barbell curl, and you feel your traps more than your biceps, bro. That's insane to think about. And that was me with like regular standing barbell curls. I like doing back supported stuff. So there's two main ones that I use. Okay, and I'm gonna weigh in on the incline curls thing, so listen up. I like both dumbbell and cable incline curls. They both have their own unique feel to it. A lot of times I actually prefer the dumbbell one, not because it's better, but because honestly, bro, I trained at home a lot on my bells and steel stuff and I don't have a cable system. I don't have a low pulley, just a high pulley. I need to get a low pulley and I can't do the cable curls at home, bro. I'm just going to keep it a buck. I can't. I can do the behind the back curls with my lever arm, but it just doesn't feel the same. It's, it feels good, but not quite the same. Dumbbells are more convenient. Whichever you like, bro, working a back supported curl and then also a stretched base curl, like the incline curls is great. Now, if you wanted to do just the back supported curl, bro, literally, you see that wall behind me? You put your back to it and you curl. You do a competition strict curl. Now, why do I like incline curls so much? Well, it's just simple, bro, and I don't have any scientific fucking method to explain this. I can just look at my training history, what has always worked for me, and then extrapolate that to other muscle groups. Classically, for me, Stuff like stiff leg deadlifts, RDLs, ring push-ups, stuff that really targets the stretch has always worked really well for me. What does an incline curl do? It targets the stretch, whether you're doing that with dumbbells or with cables. And since adding them, bro, uh, the pump that I can get even from low reps is incredible. It's insane how well the movement works for me. I lost count of where we're at, bro, to be honest with you. I think it's seven and eight. But I, what I know is, is that it's the rope push downs and the rope extensions. My rule of thumb, and this is just me, I'm speaking for myself and people that I work with as well, because I train them similarly to myself if I can. If it uses a rope, the answer is yes when it comes to triceps. What about this exercise, bro? Does it use a rope? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. Regular rope push downs, dual rope push downs, dual rope extensions, single rope extensions. Single arm rope, it doesn't matter, bro. If it uses a rope, the answer is yes. Now, why is the rope important? Why is it so magical? Why am I shilling the rope? Well, here's why, listen up. So the biggest thing that limits tricep growth in my experience and just observationally in others, isn't how hard you can train them, it's how hard you can train them without your elbow getting fucked up, okay? And a lot of times with the straight bar and the V bar, those are amazing, bro, I love them too. 
but I really prefer the rope because there's just something about it that keeps your elbow loose as a goose. A lot of times when you do extensions, overhead extensions to really stretch the long head of your tricep, bro, you get elbow fatigue, you get elbow pain at worst. But with the rope, for some reason, I don't need to warm up my elbows very much past like regular warm up stuff. Otherwise, if I'm doing like a straight bar extension, I need to do my press downs first and then the extensions. But for me, and I'm again, speaking for myself, this is just food for thought. I don't need to warm up the same way with the rope extensions. I'm gonna still recommend you do that if you're not me, you know, unless you're like a test tube clone of myself, warm up your elbows before you do extensions. But for me, that's just how it's worked. All right, fellas, last but not least, the legs, particularly the thighs. Now I've never traditionally struggled with hamstrings, hip hinges, hamstring curls, unga boonga, it's always worked really well for me. Unfortunately, nothing compares to squats, but squats work my hamstrings and my back and my glutes a lot more than my legs, particularly my quads. That's if I don't do anything to it. So with the bench, we talked about a technique adjustment with the squats, easy technique adjustment in our first exercise for the legs is going to be the plat squat. Now, varying degrees of heel elevation. The harsher the heel elevation, the more forward knee travel you're gonna get relative to your regular squat. For my regular squat, it's almost no forward knee travel, bro. It's almost completely a hip hinge. And I'm not no jabroni squatter either, bro. Like I can take four plates for a ride for higher reps. I, I'm good at squatting, all right? But it wasn't good for my quads without the technique adjustment. Now, as I said, the wedge, whether that's a plate, it's an actual wedge, whatever the case may be, gives you more forward knee travel, it makes you more upright, and it makes it easier to keep those knees forward too. You still have to fight and be conscious of that. So you can still turn it into like a stripper squat if you're not conscious of your form, but it's a lot easier to stay in a good groove and keep your knees and your back where they need to be. Now variations. I obviously use the Bells of Steel safety bar most of the time, but if you're at home, there's no reason why if you only have a barbell, you can't do them front style, zombie style, high bar style, any way it works. If the answer is, is it plat squats? The question, all right, bro, I'm doing plat squats. Is this good with a barbell? We're doing plat squats, right? Yeah, I am. Well, the answer is yes, all right? Even Zercher plat squats, bro. I'm not even a fan of Zercher squats in general, but if you're using that heel elevation, it's gonna make even that a better leg exercise. I like the SSB, because it works the neck and the traps a little bit on top of the freaking legs, all right? So it's giving me a little bit of neck work too. Now this alone, to be honest with you, could have given me all the quad and adductor growth that I was looking for. But hip fatigue starts to come into play, especially as you start to introduce more heel elevation. Now I'm squatting poundage just way less than I can handle without the heel or without the wedge, like 100 pounds less for the same number of reps. That is a substantial difference in weight. Yet the fatigue on my hips was honestly a little bit more because I've never felt my hips like that regularly squatting, okay? So I needed something that allowed me to bias my quads without having to rely and over rely on heel elevation. So me thinking it was just the barbell for some reason, I first tried heel elevated belt squats. That probably was the worst thing I could have done just because they worked the quads really well. But on top of still elevating my heel, now the freaking belt is already compressing what's already turning into like not an injury, but it's starting to turn into a tweak. I'm feeling my hip and like the upper part of my quad a little bit, a little bit more than I should. So I can those and I thought, bro, for the difficult, what am I avoiding doing? It's these two leg machines, bro that I have always traditionally gotten the best quad workout from. It's the hack squat, and it's this freaking contraption in the gym that is a like a horizontal leg press. Bro, the depth that I can get on those, the pure quad beat down I can get on them without any hip fatigue and without anything limiting the movement but quads is incredible. I get like the most dangerous mutant pump on specifically that horizontal leg press. We're talking my VMOs are so pumped they look like freaking sirloin steaks, or at least they feel that way as well. They feel dangerously pumped, like my knee is gonna explode into outer space, but not in an injurious way and like, damn, my legs are pumped kind of way, all right? So I really connect with those. Not a lot of people are gonna have that exact machine, but hack squats do the same thing. For me, it's just, I prefer the leg press because I don't have any axial, like lower, not lower back, but like spinal fatigue. I don't have the machines, weights compressing my back. 
because it's all lateral, left and right, okay? So I prefer the leg press. I'm pretty sure we're way past 10 exercises, bro. Leave it to me to put 10 in the title and then end up talking about like 14, all right? But the newest addition of my leg training and something that I see a lot of potential in because it's checking all those boxes. No hip fatigue, no lower back fatigue, and then tons of quad stimulus and quad fatigue is the pendulum sissy squat, bro. I gotta eat my humble pie, all right? I made a Q&A talking about, you'll never get big legs with freaking body weight calisthenics. In my defense, uh, bro, I didn't even think to do them like this, all right? I wanna make sure that it's stable so that you can trust that it's not gonna tip over and collapse your coconut, all right? But my knees go way over my toes with this. The quad pump that I get from this is incredible. I hit a 21 rep set the other day and it felt like my legs turned into watermelons, bro. That's how effective it was. All right, bro, that's all she wrote. Mutant's natty training talk has come to a close. Very highly caffeinated. I come out here and we just chat about training, bro. It's very off the cuff. I enjoy making these style of videos, bro. To be honest with you, they're a lot of fun. Now, two things, if you made it to the end of the video, first and foremost, thank you, bro. I also just want to mention uh, my new sponsorship through Rascal Apparel. I have been wearing freaking one rep man stringer. I've worked out in it, had it for quite a while now. I have a discount code. It's called Omni at checkout. You get 10% off your whole order. You're gonna use that discount code, get like 10 stringers. All jokes aside, bro, this is just for fellas that have, and I struggle with this, so I'm just gonna be a little vulnerable with you here. There's a reason why, despite the size of my following, I don't have like a hundred clients. Not because I can't, it's because I choose not to. This is the reason why I'm not churning out freaking $50 programs every month when I could. It's because you don't need to do all that to get jacked, bro. It's just the means for fellas who have wanted to support me or even just want to get some freaking merch to be able to do that and for me to feel good about it. Omar is a fantastic gentleman. We talked about freaking video games for hours before we even got down to business, bro. So I, I can stand behind this brand. It, it's it's a seamless conversion, bro. Like, it, 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 I just I just fit the look, okay? And I feel like we're gonna have a lot of fun together, Omar and I. So if you wanna support me, again, that is code Omni at checkout on rascalapparel.com. There's links in the description. I appreciate y'all guys. Have a great day.